like to to thank uh, the the director of the Centro de Estudios Puerto Ricanos, Dr. Edwin Melendez, for uh, inviting me uh, and supporting me uh, through this book launch, and for all the staff and colleagues and friends that are here. Uh, it gives me great pleasure um, to see everyone, and I hope that we'll have enough time to, to cover at least part of, of what I've done. Um, I will be, t uh, my talk is based on a 25-year longitudinal intergenerational study, so I don't hope to cover uh, a quarter of the material, <laughs> but I hope, what I hope to do today is just to give you an overview and then maybe open it up to questions and then I can address specific issues that you might be interested in. Um, so let me begin. Um, Puerto Rican women have one of the highest rates of sterilization in the world. In 1982, 39% of the female population in, in Puerto Rico between the ages of 15 and 45 were surgically sterilized. In 1982, I also found that 47% of the Puerto Rican women living in one neighborhood in Brooklyn, where I did my field work, were also surgically sterilized. It, coincidentally, in 1982, another study that was undertaken in Hartford, Connecticut found that 51% of the female population there was surgically sterilized. And in 1995, and these are the, the last statistics available, 50% of Hispanic women in New York City were surgically sterilized as compared to 27.6% for white women, 25.8% for black women, and 2.4% for Asian women. And I'm assuming that a large number of those women in New York City that were sterilized in up until 1995 are of Puerto Rican heritage as well because of the long history of sterilization that they have, although they are not exclusively uh, Puerto Rican women. Of course, then, with these statistics, the question that my study raises is, why do Puerto Rican women have such a high rate of sterilization? And um, the literature, which, you know, this is something that now I've been investigating for decades, is basically broken down into two schools of thought. One school argues that all Puerto Rican women are victims of sterilization abuse. And the other school argues that they are free agents who exercise reproductive freedom. Um, and so this is where I began my research, uh, looking at these kind of polar extremes. And, uh, and so I decided to do my own study uh, in my own backyard in Brooklyn, uh, in, in a, an adjacent neighborhood where I grew up. Um, so I'm pretty familiar about what I will be discussing tonight on a personal uh, as well as a professional level. My research reformulates this oppositional framework between victimhood and agency or absolute agency. It rejects the notion that Puerto Rican women are either voluntary agents or powerless victims and demonstrates that neither of these polar extremes presents an integral picture of most Puerto Rican women's reproductive experiences. Uh, I've been working on a model for a long time and, and, and trying to understand this. I have many personal anecdotes that I could share with you. Uh, but the, the model that I've been that I've developed and that I've written about in my book, Matters of Choice, transcends this either or perspective. And it tries to synthesize, um, integrate, and transcend and, uh, and be inclusive of each of these realms. So I'm looking at uh, the personal reasons why women were sterilized, the cultural reasons, the social, as well as the historical. And a lot of the studies that have been done that either take the perspective that all women are victims of sterilization abuse or they're all voluntary agents, the, those who argue that this is uh, voluntary tend to relegate women to the individual and cultural level. And those who argue that their victims tend to uh, base their analysis on history 
uh, and colonialism and, and sort of s structural uh, forces. And what I'm simply saying is that we need to do all of these things in order to get, I think, a more a, um, nuanced view of what Puerto Rican women's experiences have been and are with regards to sterilization. Okay, so I propose a third model, an integral model of reproductive freedom and social justice that allows us to take agency resistance and other variables into account while exposing and challenging the ideology of choice. Um, and in, in my objective in doing this was precisely to look at all of these levels. And I'm going to begin with the history of Puerto Rico, for those of you who might not be familiar um, with, with, the his, with the Caribbean. Uh, and then I'm going to go through all of the realms. Um, so as most of you know here, especially at the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, uh, Puerto Rico became a colony of the United States in 1898. The uh, in, by 1899, a census had been taken, and the, and the argument that was developed was that Puerto Rico suffered from an overpopulation problem. This is when Puerto Rico had fewer than a million people. The solutions to that overpopulation problem uh, were sterilization and migration. Migration was used as the temporary escape valve, and, and as most of you know, the migration of, from Puerto Rico has been taking place since the time of the Spaniards and, and in the early part of the 20th century until now. And sterilization, which came a little bit later, was considered the permanent solution to the overpopulation problem. Overpopulation problem was based on, uh, or the justification for sterilization and migration was based on two ideologies, the neo-Malthusian and the eugenic ideology. The, the uh, neo-Malthusian essentially equ says that overpopulation equals uh, underdevelopment and poverty, and the eugenic ideology essentially says that some people are inferior to others and therefore not fit to reproduce, right? And those are the two ideologies that accompanied these kinds of both official and unofficial population policies. Now, uh, I'm sure some of you, uh, maybe most of you already know uh, a lot about the eugenic uh, movement. Uh, and it's a movement that um, emerged in the early part of the 20th century in the United States. Uh, basically, the movement was a campaign to sterilize anyone that was considered genetically or intellectually inferior. Uh, and you can, you know, just by Googling eugenics, uh, all of these archives, you know, uh, millions of archives on, on the subject have been written. Uh, and essentially the belief was that intelligence and social ills were hereditary. Okay? Eugenics was in vogue in the early part of the 20th century through the 30s and even the 40s in the United States and in the Caribbean. Um, this races and classes ideology essentially emerged uh, in the xenophobic social Darwinist period uh, at the end of the 19th and early 20th century when thousands of Eastern and Southern European immigrants migrated to the United States. And by 1924, uh, it was part of uh, 25 U.S. 25, by 1924, 25 U.S. states had sterilization legislation. It was this legislation that was transferred to Puerto Rico in 1937, um, this eugenic le legislation, uh, to essentially sterilized, to use sterilization as a form of population control on the island. Now, it's very important um, that I s probably say the obvious, which is that many Puerto Rican women, I would say the majority of Puerto Rican women and other Latinas, and women as well as men, think of sterilization as birth control. Uh, and in fact, technically, it is, right? It's, it's, uh, it's the uh, tubal ligation is the female sterilization, vasectomy is the male sterilization. But we need to make a distinction between birth control or sterilization used as birth control and sterilization used as population control, right? Uh, birth control is an individual right, it's a human right, it's the ability to space, control, prevent, and end a pregnancy. Uh, 
And population control is when contraceptives or ferti fertility control like sterilization is used by the state to lower the birth rate of a country. And um, many people have written about this, um, uh, both in the Caribbean and the United States and Latin America. Um, now, in the case of Puerto Rico, the Puerto Rican government has always denied that an official sterilization program ever existed. Yet, as we saw by 1982, 39 percent of the female population was surgically sterilized. But I'm going to get into the reasons for that in a few minutes. Um, I'd just like to preface and, and not spend a great deal in, in, in the historical realm, but to preface this by talking a little bit about the birth control movement on the island. Um, because there were many players, uh, the Catholic Church, nationalist groups, the U.S. government, public health officials, and Puerto Rican feminists who were both public health officials and nationalists. And all of these groups uh, played a huge role in shaping uh, and influencing the kind of birth control program that developed in Puerto Rico. Um, <clears throat> but I have to say that that program was based primarily on sterilization, since the government felt that that was the solution, one of the solutions to the overpopulation problem. It's something that many doctors and many administrators uh, in all different areas adhere to and, and, and agreed with because everyone thought, yes, Puerto Rico had an overpopulation problem. The critics of that argument would say that Puerto Rico's overpopulation problem was created through colonialism and internal migration and the kind of economy that it developed and, and you know, and kept um, developing. Um, but that's, you know, you can read about that uh, in my book if you like, um, and others have written about the history. Um, there were some very important uh, players in, in the history, in the development of the birth control movement in Puerto Rico. Uh, among them, Margaret Sanger uh, was a very important figure. And actually, she, um, a, a very important person, uh, a feminist in the first wave, during the first wave of feminism, uh, who did a great deal, but also uh, was very influential in uh, having the, the birth control pill tested on Puerto Rican women. Um, she originally wanted it to be tested in India, um, but it didn't happen that way. And, and in the 50s, when the pill was actually developed, uh, that's where it was tested. And um, and she, she was the one who got the patron who uh, helped the scientists who developed, Pincus, who developed the birth control pill, um, choose Puerto Rico, et cetera. And I think that's a part of a fascinating history there. Um, and, and I think raises questions, uh, you know, about feminism and, and all of these other things. Um, but there were many people. Uh, so G Gamble, for example, who was the heir of Procter and Gamble, actually created certain gaps in, in the birth control market because he, he, one of the things that he did was work with pharmaceuticals. Um, and he, um, he had his own me uh, method of birth control that he wanted to test and put on the market, uh, a contraceptive foam. And in fact, in 1940, this is still when Puerto Rico was in its agricultural stage, um, he did put his, this contraceptive foam out. It failed miserably, and the rate of sterilization grew as a result of that. So part of, of what I'm alluding to is these are the reasons why so many Puerto Rican women accepted sterilization. You know, I'm sure lots of people have asked the question, well, why, you know, even if it's, it's a government program, why would so many women accept it? And even after a while, seek it out. And it's essentially because there were very, very few other contraceptives available. Um, the Catholic Church and the nationalist groups played a very influential role in closing the clinics that, the birth control clinics that were open by, by individual doctors and public health officials because, of course, they were against birth control and sterilization. Uh, and abortion. And so uh, it, it, there was this constant tug of war. Um, the clinics were poorly stocked. Uh, let, let me just say that it wasn't until 1968 that Puerto Rico received federal funds for contraceptives island-wide. 
and from 1937, sterilization was readily available. Uh, and even though the church was against it, they w they were much more adamantly opposed excuse me, adamantly opposed to birth control than they were to sterilization because sterilization occurred before conception. Um, and they also considered that if a woman gets sterilized, that's one sin, but if she uses birth control, then she's sinning over and over again. And so that was, you know, part of the logic and the rationale that came from the church, which was so important, especially during that period of time. And then uh, keeping in mind, once again, before uh, Puerto Rico was industrialized, that women had large families because there was a high rate of infant mortality, there was an ec economic value to children, and a very high rate of maternal mortality as well. And then uh, keeping in mind, once again, before uh, Puerto Rico was industrialized, that women had large families because there was a high rate of infant mortality, there was an ec economic value to children, and a very high rate of maternal mortality as well. Um, now, in, it, it, industrialization took place in Puerto Rico between the 1940s and the 50s. Um, the, the name of the industrialization program uh, was Operation Bootstrap. Industrialization was a good thing uh, for, for many people. It, it allowed them to have running water and electricity in their homes and better living conditions. Um, but it also caused internal migration because people went to the cities, to the urban areas, looking for the, for the jobs. And then, of course, when this happened, uh, and due to the kind of industrialization that occurred, the manufacturing industry came first, and that was a labor-intensive phase that provided a lot of jobs for people. But then the capital-intensive phase, or white-collar jobs, came followed very quickly after, before 10 years. And so that created more unemployment. Now people were concentrated in more dense areas, in urban areas, and the, and the overpopulation argument was um, invoked again. Um, between 1940 and the 1950s, approximately a million Puerto Ricans migrated to New York City in search of jobs and a better life. Um, so, okay, so now let's, we're in New York. Um, and just going back a little bit, it's the 21st century. Uh, I can just say that sterilization is one of the oldest methods of reproductive technology and the most popular method of fertility control practically in the world today. It's, it's maybe a hair away from popularity in terms of the pill. It's not just Puerto Rican women who are getting sterilized today, but you know, throughout Latin America, the third world, in the United States, uh, there is a very high percentage of tubal ligation. Um, but of course, in the case of poor women, and I'm talking about it, it, the women in my study were all working class women, the globalization of sterilization doesn't erase the tainted eugenic legacy based on race, class, and gender. The question uh, that I asked myself uh, when I did my research in New York was also, how is it maintained and perpetuated? Why does it continue to increase? Now that other methods of birth control are available, women have other options, especially in the second and third generation, um, why do Puerto Rican women continue to get sterilized? And I think that there are many reasons for this. Uh, part of it is a cultural predisposition, the fact that Puerto Rican women have been getting sterilized for many generations now. Uh, they have they have a certain relationship. In fact, people don't talk about sterilization as tubal ligation. They talk about it as la operación. La operación means literally right the operation. But when someone in Puerto Rico says la operación, everyone knows what that means. And what it means to them is in quotes the tying and cutting of the tubes, right? And that's what we're talking about. Um, Puerto Rican women uh, have a high rate of misinformation about uh, the about the permanent the permanent nature of sterilization. Uh, they believe that if you have your tubes tied within a period of five to seven years, they will become untied naturally. But if you have them cut, that that's the permanent operation. So that when 
when they say I, I had my tubes cut, that means to them, I don't want any more children, although some of them have changed their minds. Um, the number of children that women have today, of course, varies across generations. In, in the past, in, in the, let's say the grandmother's generation, women had many children. Those women grew up in, ag in an agricultural environment where there were few methods of birth control. They didn't have access to clinics. clinics. They had their children at home with midwives, etc. Their daughters, uh, who I call the mother's generation, who were born and raised here uh, or came he to New York when they were very young, tend to have between three and four children. But their daughters, the granddaughters, only generally want between one or at the most two children, right? So that the idea that people's idea of the desired family size, of course, has changed over time and with the environment. Now, um, when, when Puerto Ricans came to New York City in the 50s, um, for a little while, they, 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 went, they came to work in the manufacturing industry. Uh, but the manufacturing industry left New York City in 1960, and they came in large numbers by 1950. So within a 10-year period of time, they, had, they got jobs, they, they did very well. By 1960, though, when, when uh, most of these women were essentially blue-collar workers, worked in factories, when the garment industry left, many of them lost their jobs. They were the last to come, so the, the last hired, the first fired, so to speak. Um, now, at the same time that Puerto Ricans were entering New York, so was a very large uh, number of African Americans, right? Because of automation, globalization, we're talking about the 1950s, the technological era. Um, automation took place in the southern part of the United States, and so the African American population, another poor population like Puerto Ricans, entered New York City, Manhattan specifically, uh, during that period of time. Uh, because of the exodus of, of the manufacturing industry, there was a rise in female-headed households across the board, across ethnic and racial groups, uh, a rise in aid for dependent children among women of all groups as well. But um, because Puerto Ricans and African Americans, excuse me, were entering in large numbers during the, the 60s, and they were here in large numbers by the 60s, there was a kind of representation or scapegoating uh, or, or we could say a demonization of women of color's fertility. They were represented in the 70s as uh, both black and Puerto Rican women as, in quotes, reckless breeders, welfare queens. Um, and and this, was, this was the kind of environment um, that was taking place during this period of time. And that's the same period of time um, if you know a little bit about the history of sterilization abuse, that a lot of the cases of abuse also took place between the 60s and the 70s. Um, we had, there were other things happening socially. The civil rights movement was taking place, the black power movement, the women's liberation movement. Uh, but the rate of, of sterilization continued to increase. By in 1976, uh, New York City passed their sterilization guidelines to protect women and men from sterilization abuse. Um, and so this is all happening during that same period of time. Now, I, I like to look at the personal, the cultural, um, the, the social, and we've already talked a little bit about the historical reasons, and also keep an eye on the time because I know that I want to leave time for questions. But let me just give you a list of some of the personal reasons that women, that the women that I worked with, um, in terms of my methodology, I, I did a survey, um, of, and I also did oral histories. And I worked with five families on an intergenerational basis, um, sort of across 25 years. So I literally watched their children grow up and sort of their opinions and ideas about sexuality take forms and I saw the conflicts, the intergenerational conflicts that occurred and how women negotiated these things and men too. The, the, the first thing that I like to say in terms of the personal reasons and this goes, this cuts across generations is that women do not want to have a lot of children. This is true of Puerto Rican women. Um, 
They want to do other things with their lives in addition to having children. And in fact, I would say 50% of the women in my survey um, were ser sterilized before they immigrated to New York City from Puerto Rico, right? So we're talking about a sample of 132 women. 50% of them were already sterilized. Um, they, they also want to have, they told me they want to have fewer children so that they can take better care of the children they already have. Children are expensive. Um, many of them, when they, when they achieve their desired family size, which I said varies across generations, uh, that's when they think about getting la operación. Now, um, the, the women in the mothers and granddaughters generations have access to birth control, to temporary methods of birth control. However, one of the things that I found is that although a high rate uh, of women use uh, contraceptives, 76%, um, many of them do not have accidents. Many of them have had accidents while using them. And so what I learned uh, um, among women in the granddaughter's generation and the, in the mother's generation is that they don't know how to use them as effectively as uh, I, I thought they did. And so that leads to accidental pregnancies, which then leads to getting sterilized as a last resort. Uh, women are also, on a personal level, sterilized because of problematic relationships due to domestic violence or substance abuse, or simply that they don't want to continue having children with a particular partner. Uh, sometimes women also get sterilized as a form of gender resistance uh, due to gender subordination, and um, and that's that's an interesting topic to talk about when we have a little bit more time. All right, let me just go over very quickly the cultural reasons or the cultural realm. Um, Puerto Rican women have been getting sterilized since 1937, several generations. Women recommend la operación to one another. Uh, doctors recommend la operación to women. Uh, so it's, it's, it, it cuts across you know, the um, support groups. It moves into the medical arena. Uh, there's, as I mentioned before, misinformation. And so um, that misinformation that I talked about with the tying and cutting of the tubes is, is aggravated with the kind of medical language that is used today uh, when they talk about tubal ligations, the bikini cut or band-aid operation, which, ten which tends to minimize uh, sort of the permanence of the operation to in these women's eyes, and they think that it's something that they'll be able to reverse later. And of course, there, it, when I was doing this research about 10 years ago, I realized there was a new type of misinformation developing, which was that women thought, even those who had their tubes cut, that if they had them, if they went back and had another operation, that they would very easily be able to conceive and have children again. But that isn't so. In some, in a small percentage of cases, that occurs. It depends on the kind of of technique and procedure that was used. But the majority of the women that in this study ended up with ectopic pregnancies, which is when the ovum is fertilized in the fallopian tube, it explodes and a woman can die. It's a very serious condition uh, and situation. But these women uh, that did go back because they regretted that they were sterilized to begin with weren't aware that this was one of the risks that they were taking. Okay, social forces, and I'm coming, um, getting close to the end here. Poverty, the number one reason why women said that they were sterilized, but it's not the only reason. In other words, I never, perhaps I met a few women who said they did it only because of economic reasons, but there are so many other factors, and what I learned is that there are always a myriad forces at work operating that lead women, uh, that influence and shape their fertility decisions. And I'm, I am talking about women who feel that they make decisions now. I am not talking about classical uh, victims of sterilization abuse who have gone in to have this operation and have come out with something else. There, I do have uh, several cases of sterilization abuse, classical sterilization abuse, in my study, but that I did, I did not find that to be the majority of women uh, in the 25-year period that I studied in Brooklyn. Okay, uh, 
Another factor that has an indirect effect on women's decisions to get sterilized is that the neighborhoods that they live in have high rates of crime. They're afraid to let their children out into the street because of fear that they might be influenced by bad friends, and so they tend to try to keep them at home. People live in small apartments to begin with, and so you know, dealing on a day-to-day -day basis with many children or even a few children at home is, is, is a factor that influences them as well. Lack of access to quality health care services is an, is an important one. Um, because when women don't have access to quality health care services, that means that they don't have access to quality family planning counseling either. And I found in sitting in on, on many of these um, sessions that women go to that, that especially in public hospitals that have very few resources and even with very well-intentioned counselors and, and, uh, and social workers and other people, uh, women come in and shift. So let's say I have a shift of 20 people here, of 20 women, and I'm supposed to, in 15 or 20 minutes, inform them and get them to agree on some f method of, of birth control. And oftentimes, uh, what I found the family planning counselor saying was, well, maybe you should think about sterilization. Since women are already familiar with this, it's been recommended by other women as well. They know many women in their families who've been sterilized. It, 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 you know, it contributes. Um, to their decisions. Um, okay, so in conclusion, and then I will open it up to question. Um, sterilization technology per se is neither good or bad, I think. The problem with it is the way it has been used as a form of population control among Puerto Rican women uh, and other women as well. Uh, in order to make fully conscious reproductive decisions that optimizes the reproductive freedom of all women and men, we need to transcend the either-or perspective and integrate the individual's needs and motivations within the broader socio-political and historical framework that is based on race, class, ethnicity, and history. This framework allows us to take agency, resistance, and other variables into account while exposing and challenging the ideology of choice and social inequity. Um, I gave you the history already about when sterilization was implemented in Puerto Rico. Uh, in New York City, I would say that the high rate um, the high rate of sterilization here has been maintained and perpetuated through women and men's cultural familiarity with la operación, their poverty, their desire to control their fertility, their lack of access to quality health care services and family planning counseling, misinformation about the permanent nature of la operación, as well as women's desire to control their bodies and as a form of gender resistance. Um, in the case of Puerto Rico, I think that what intersected and, and led to such a high rate of sterilization there was that women's needs to control their fertility intersected with the state's desire to lower the, rate, the birth rate. And so, you know, you have this kind of intersection going on, then of course, and all of the other f factors that I've mentioned played a very important role. Um, in summary, Puerto Rican women make reproductive decisions for the most part, unless they're victims of sterilization abuse. However, choosing between sterilization and continuing to have children under adverse conditions or getting sterilized as a last resort after having more children than they desire does not, in my opinion, constitute reproductive freedom. Although all women's reproductive choices are constrained, regardless of class and race, poor women's reproductive freedom is even more limited because of their poverty and lack of access to quality health care services, which, as I said before, limits their knowledge about contraceptives and reinforces their misinformation about the permanent nature of tubal ligation. My study shows that Puerto Rican women do not have full access to the, to the methods of birth control available on the market today. So for example, I, found, I found that women were not familiar with the diaphragm in general. Um, they had problems uh, using the pill. You know, all, they didn't have all of the information that they needed, that kind of thing. Uh, in order for women to exercise reproductive freedom, men and women must have viable reproductive options.
Reproductive uh, freedom consists of the personal and political ability to decide if and how and with whom a person may want to have children free of coercion or violence. It also entails having social conditions that, in, that enable an individual to have children, um, for example, having viable birth control options, quality health care, family planning, prenatal care, child care, the right to legal abortion, and a support system that allows women and men to raise children in a healthy environment. Uh, as long as sterilization continues to be used as population control in the third world, and Puerto Rican and other poor racialized women in the United States are represented as a burden on the state and continue to get sterilized, because they do not have access to adequate living conditions and access to quality health care services, Puerto Rican women will not exercise complete reproductive freedom. Thank you. Now, I, I like to look at the personal, the cultural, um, the, the social, and we've already talked a little bit about the historical reasons, and also keep an eye on the time, because I know that I want to leave time for questions. But let me just give you a list of some of the personal reasons that women, that the women that I worked with, um, in terms of my methodology, I, I did a survey. Um, and I also did oral histories, and I worked with five families on an intergenerational basis, um, sort of across 25 years. So I literally watched their children grow up and sort of their opinions and ideas about sexuality take forms, and I saw the conflicts, the intergenerational conflicts that occurred and how women negotiated these things, and men too. The, the the first thing that I like to say in terms of the personal reasons, and this goes this cuts across generations, is that women do not want to have a lot of children. This is true of Puerto Rican women. Um, they want to do other things with their lives in addition to having children. And in fact, I would say 50% of the women in my survey um, were ser sterilized before they immigrated to New York City from Puerto Rico, right? So we're talking about a sample of 132 women. 50% of them were already sterilized. Um, they, they also want to have, they told me they want to have fewer children so that they can take better care of the children they already have. Children are expensive. Um, many of them, when they, when they achieve their desired family size, which I said varies across generations, uh, that's when they think about getting la operación. Now, um, the, the women in the mothers and granddaughters generations have access to birth control, to temporary methods of birth control. However, one of the things that I found is that although a high rate uh, of women use uh, contraceptives, 76%, um, many of them do not have accidents. Many of them have had accidents while using them. And so what I learned uh, um, among women in the granddaughter's generation and the, in the mother's generation is that they don't know how to use them as effectively as uh, I, I thought they did. And so that leads to accidental pregnancies, which then leads to getting sterilized as a last resort. Uh, women are also, on a personal level, sterilized because of problematic relationships due to domestic violence or substance abuse, or simply that they don't want to continue having children with a particular partner. Uh, sometimes women also get sterilized as a form of gender resistance uh, due to gender subordination. And, um, and that's, that's an interesting topic to talk about when we have a little bit more time. All right, let me just go over very quickly the cultural reasons or the cultural realm. Um, Puerto Rican women have been getting sterilized since 1937, several generations. Women recommend la operación to one another. Uh, doctors recommend la operación to women. Uh, so it's, it's, it, it cuts across, you know, the um, support groups. It moves into the medical arena. Uh, there's, as I mentioned before, misinformation. And so um, 
that misinformation that I talked about with the tying and cutting of the tubes is, is aggravated with the kind of medical language that is used today uh, when they talk about tubal ligations, the bikini cut or band-aid operation, which, ten which tends to minimize uh, sort of the permanence of the operation to in these women's eyes, and they think that it's something that they'll be able to reverse later. And of course, there, when I was doing this research about 10 years ago, I realized there was a new type of misinformation developing, which was that women thought, even those who had their tubes cut, that if they had them, if they went back and had another operation, that they would very easily be able to conceive and have children again. But that isn't so. In some, in a small percentage of cases, that occurs. It depends on the kind of of technique and procedure that was used. But the majority of the women that in this study ended up with ectopic pregnancies, which is when the ovum is fertilized in the fallopian tube, it explodes and a woman can die. It's a very serious condition uh, and situation. But these women uh, that did go back because they regretted that they were sterilized to begin with weren't aware that this was one of the risks that they were taking. Okay, social forces, and I'm coming, um, getting close to the end here. Poverty, the number one reason why women said that they were sterilized, but it's not the only reason. In other words, I never, perhaps I met a few women who said they did it only because of economic reasons, but there are so many other factors, and what I learned is that there are always a myriad forces at work operating that lead women, uh, that influence and shape their fertility decisions. And I'm, I am talking about women who feel that they make decisions now. I am not talking about classical uh, victims of sterilization abuse who have gone in to have this operation and have come out with something else. There, I do have uh, several cases of sterilization abuse, classical sterilization abuse, in my study, but that I did, I did not find that to be the majority of women uh, in the 25-year period that I studied in Brooklyn. Okay, uh, another factor that has an indirect effect on women's decisions to get sterilized is that the neighborhoods that they live in have high rates of crime. They're afraid to let their children out into the street because of fear that they might be influenced by bad friends, and so they tend to try to keep them at home. People live in small apartments to begin with, and so you know, dealing on a day-to-day -day basis with many children or even a few children at home is, is, is a factor that influences them as well. Lack of access to quality healthcare services is an, is an important one. Um, because when women don't have access to quality health care services, that means that they don't have access to quality family planning counseling either. And I found in sitting in on, on many of these um, sessions that women go to that, that especially in public hospitals that have very few resources and even with very well-intentioned counselors and and, of, and social workers and other people, uh, women come in and shift. So let's say I have a shift of 20 people here, of 20 women, and I'm supposed to, in 15 or 20 minutes, inform them and get them to agree on some f method of, of birth control. And oftentimes, uh, what I found the family planning counselor saying was, well, maybe you should think about sterilization. Since women are already familiar with this, it's been recommended by other women as well. They know many women in their family who've been sterilized, it, 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 you know, it contributes um, to their decisions. Um, okay, so in conclusion, and then I will open it up to question. Um, sterilization technology per se is neither good or bad. I think the problem with it is the way it has been used as a form of population control among Puerto Rican women uh, and other women as well. Uh, in order to make fully conscious reproductive decisions that optimizes the reproductive freedom of all women and men, we need to transcend the either-or perspective and integrate the individual's needs and motivations within the broader socio-political and historical framework that is based on race, class, ethnicity, and history. This framework allows us to take agency, resistance, and other variables into account while exposing and challenging the ideology of choice and social inequity. Um, 
I gave you the history already about when sterilization was implemented in Puerto Rico. Uh, in New York City, I would say that the high rate um, the high rate of sterilization here has been maintained and perpetuated through women and men's cultural familiarity with la operación, their poverty, their desire to control their fertility, their lack of access to quality health care services and family planning counseling, misinformation about the permanent nature of la operación, as well as women's desire to control their bodies and as a form of gender resistance. Um, in the case of Puerto Rico, I think that what intersected and, and led to such a high rate of sterilization there was that women's needs to control their fertility intersected with the state's desire to lower the rate, the birth rate. And so, you know, you have this kind of intersection going on, then of course, and all of the other f factors that I've mentioned played a very important role. Um, in summary, Puerto Rican women make reproductive decisions for the most part, unless they're victims of sterilization abuse. However, choosing between sterilization and continuing to have children under adverse conditions or getting sterilized as a last resort after having more children than they desire does not, in my opinion, constitute reproductive freedom. Although all women's reproductive choices are constrained, regardless of class and race, poor women's reproductive freedom is even more limited because of their poverty and lack of access to quality health care services, which, as I said before, limits their knowledge about contraceptives and reinforces their misinformation about the permanent nature of tubal ligation. My study shows that Puerto Rican women do not have full access to the, to the methods of birth control available on the market today. So for example, I found, I found that women were not familiar with the diaphragm in general. Um, they had problems uh, using the pill. You know, all, they didn't have all of the information that they needed, that kind of thing. Uh, in order for women to exercise reproductive freedom, men and women must have viable reproductive options. Reproductive uh, freedom consists of the personal and political ability to decide if and how and with whom a person may want to have children free of coercion or violence. It also entails having social conditions that, in, that enable an individual to have children, um, for example, having viable birth control options, quality health care, family planning, prenatal care, child care the right to legal abortion, and a support system that allows women and men to raise children in a healthy environment. Uh, as long as sterilization continues to be used as population control in the third world, and Puerto Rican and other poor racialized women in the United States are represented as a burden on the state and continue to get sterilized, because they do not have access to adequate living conditions and access to quality health care services, Puerto Rican women will not exercise complete reproductive freedom. Thank you. Yes, they did. Uh, some favored it. Uh, they certainly favored birth control. Uh, and, and some did not. The men tended not to favor sterilization or birth control, the nationalists. But the women who have the children, right, they, they, they did. Many of them fought for it. And in fact, many of the feminists were also public health officials and, and worked with the women on a day-to-day -day basis and saw their problems and tried to help them out. So. So there was a real struggle. It was a gender struggle, but it was also a national struggle, um, and you know, on many different levels. Did I answer your question? Okay. Right now, most Puerto Rican women are Catholic, and yes, in many ways, that's exactly what happened. W women are very practical, and so. Um, for example, the ones who had an abortion, even though they they would w were the first to tell me that they were against abortion, but they had an abortion, and they felt it was a necessary sin, something that they had to do, right? So, I mean, that kind of shows you the complexity of these issues that we're talking about. It's the, these things are not black and white, um, but. With respect to sterilization, there was no stigma associated with sterilization like there uh, is and, and was with abortion. And so women tended to talk about it very easily. Uh, they had more difficulty discussing a hysterectomy 
with me because there is a stigma associated with having hysterectomies in the Latino community than with a tubal ligation. So, so in other words, when they went to confessional, they didn't have to confess that they were sterilized, but they had to probably confess that they had an abortion. Right. And also women often said that the church was not going to support their family and they had to do something. So they were taking matters into their own hands. Well, the, the film La Operación is, is basically uh, based on this kind of binary model, right, that, that, that I used in the past too. I mean, I used to think that way as well. Uh, either women are all victims or they're all exercising free will. In fact, when I started to do this research many years ago, I had a hard time hearing from women that this is what they wanted to do because I didn't know how to explain that. What does that mean that this is what they want to do? Uh, I thought that uh, the majority of women that I was going to be meeting were victims of sterilization abuse. And in fact, you know, uh, many groups, the, the CESA, right, the Committee Against Sterilization Abuse and CARASA, uh, you know, have galvanized around these issues and I think that they're important issues and, and these women have done wonderful work. Uh, so, so I think that La Operación, the film uh, by Ana Garcia, is modeled on that binary thinking, that, or that essentially that all women are victims of sterilization abuse, or that they were misinformed, or, and, and there's a lot of that. So this is where the integral model comes in. It's not that that is completely wrong, right? It's that she was looking at it from one perspective, and it was, you know, and to explain why there's such a high rate of sterilization, and to be able to talk about oppression, and because women make decisions, in other words, doesn't mean that they're exercising reproductive freedom, right? And so people think if you're making a decision, then you are exercising. But if you don't know, or you're not fully aware, or you don't have access, then it's it's th there are degrees here of of exercising reproductive freedom, and that's what I'm trying to point out. Um, that every every woman who sterilizes is not a victim of sterilization abuse, but there are many victims in the classical sense, right? What does sterilization abuse mean? When someone gets sterilized without their knowledge or consent, right? That's what it means. And and there, I'll give you an example. There's a woman uh, in one of the families uh, that I worked with that wanted to get sterilized here in New York. She went to the hospital and instead of having a tubal ligation, they performed, the doctor performed a hysterectomy. And she felt very violated by that and, and went into a depression and it was very bad for her and her family. Uh, ironically, she wanted a tubal ligation. So, so you could see that, that you have to be able, but she had six children. So, I mean, it depends on the conditions, right? Uh, how many children, if the woman wants children, how many she has, um, et cetera, et cetera. All, all, all of the individual, the cultural, social, and, and historical forces have to be taken into consideration. Right, well, one of the things that I do in my book is I have a section called Revisiting the Ideology of Choice. Uh, and, in fact, one of the arguments made on the island was that Puerto Rican, that this high rate of sterilization was voluntary because this decision was made between the individual woman and her doctor. However, having said that, we cannot discount what women say or minimize it. Uh, if women say, even if this is the best that they can do, and, and we know, and we see all of the conditions, right? I mean, my job uh, as as an anthropologist and what I did as an ethnographer was to go out there, talk to women, and put this together. They could not analyze the history for me, and they didn't know about the high rate of sterilization, and they knew about their poverty and their 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 life conditions, right? That's what they could tell me about, and they could tell me subjectively from their perspective. Uh, but, you know, it's, uh, this is where the integral model of reproductive freedom and social justice, I think, works because then you can take what women are saying and not dismiss it or minimize it in any way, but put it within a broader context that helps explain, you know, what is going on, on, on a, not just an individual level, but on a collective level. And I don't think this is just Puerto Rican women. I, I would probably venture to say that this is probably true in most of the world. Um, so.